Amen. 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 Good morning, church. How are we? Good morning, Pastor Chris. Yeah, nice to see you guys. Casey's talking about ESCOM. It'd be a bummer if I knocked Smiley's computer over. Uh, we, we can remain calm, right? We're all adults in here. So we, we can turn our, our lights on and our guest service is going to help us get out of here. But I'd like to have one or two people volunteer that when the lights go out that you close your eyes and scream crazy and run around the room. Because we can't, we can't just be ordinary. We need to have some element of chaos in here. Uh, we need to keep people on their toes. So we, we can all agree that we can do that. But today we're talking about a story, Jonah and the Whale. Now, Jonah and the Whale is a story that, you know, kind of all of us know. But before we talk about this, I just want to ask you a question that's going to then, we're going to answer kind of at the end of the message. And that question is, do you ever get mad when, I've got a dot, dot, dot there, because specifically, do you ever get mad when something good happens to somebody that you don't think deserves it? It's like when, when you see somebody that you don't think they deserve a good thing, that, 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 that something happens to them, and you actually get mad about it. The famous example I use is I used to, many of you have heard this story, I, I had a, a Bucky that I loved, it was an old Toyota Hilux, and it broke its, its final day of death. You know, I, I was so sad to watch it go and, and know that I would never ride in it again. And then there was a, a guy, another pastor in one of the, the communities that we had helped develop and helped this church. And somebody wrote a check and bought him a brand new Hilux. And I was like, I was mad. I was like, I, I hope he pops all four tires. I just, I hope he ends up just stranded somewhere. But so obviously for you guys, because you're not petty, anyone in here petty? Yeah, anyone in here's husband or spouse or significant other petty? Some more hands go up that way. So you're not petty, so of course you don't get mad, but you know the reality is that we do. And and so we're gonna this is gonna tie in at the end. And we're gonna get into this story that we all know. It's called Jonah and the and the whale. And today's message is called A Whale of a Tale. And this is one of those, those messages, like last week we talked about David and Goliath, and it's one of those really well-known messages. And what happens is, is we start to apply our own narratives to it because we know it so well. And so when you talk about Jonah and the whale, and for those of you that know about Jonah, Jonah was fleeing God and Jonah was trying to run away, and we think, okay, what's the moral of this story? Well, it's obedience, obviously. That's why this story is here, because it teaches us to be obedient. So no matter what narrative we put to it, so we take Jonah and the well, we apply it to our life, and, and we make ourselves like the main character in it. And so we say, okay, this is a lesson on obedience. And speaking of the main character, in stories like this, last week we talked about making yourself the main character and putting yourself in the position of David, David against Goliath. Nobody wants to be Goliath. Everyone wants to say that they're like David. Well, just like in this one, guess what? The main character of this story, this is the one that everyone wants to be, but the actual main character of this story is, it's the whale. So no, no one actually wants to be the whale, but this is actually the main character because Jonah's not that exciting. The whale is what's exciting. So if you're trying to hunt for a story in the Bible to make yourself the main character of, then make it this one and become the whale. And this sermon is not a metaphor on becoming a whale, but it's more poking fun at the way that we interpret these stories and we place ourselves in these stories. And so we think that, that the actual main character is, is Jonah. And so we can identify with Jonah. We can say, okay, I'm like Jonah. I struggle with obedience. God asked me to do, you know, this. And instead, I decided not to do it. And I went here. And then, you know, the, 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 the way that God brought me back and swallowed me up and dumped me out. You know, it's, it's we say, okay, we are the Jonah. We're the modern day Jonah. And I think that there's more to this story than just the part about the whale. And in fact, that, that, that leads me to ask you guys this question or to kind of, poke the answer out of you, but why was this story written down? See, this happened in a day and age where tra traditionally stories were passed down orally. So a story like this or an event that happened like this in history would be passed down. People would tell their children, they would tell their children, they would tell their children, and that's how things would get passed down. But every now and again, something would actually be written down. So we asked this important question about this. Why was this written down? See, we have to 
We have to wrap our mind around that, that if we don't actually pay attention to the why it was written down, then we're not going to understand the what that it's trying to say. So if we don't look at why it was written, we miss what it is trying to say. See, that, that's important. See, I, I love the Bible. I think the Bible is so fun. It's so exciting. And I think there's so many amazing details in the Bible that, that we kind of like glaze over. And in the New Testament, I want you to know that there's a lot of Jesus' teaching and even Paul's teachings about the church where he is saying, hey, you, church, do this. Now that is written for you. It's a directive. It's something for you to do. But when it comes to Jonah and the whale, or David and Goliath, or Noah and the flood, or one of those things, Jonah and the whale was not written for you. It wasn't written for an instruction to you. We can use it as inspiration. We can use it to guide ourselves. But we have to say, why was this written? And as we ask why it was written down, we, we then learn, what is it trying to say? And so that, that's what we're going to get into today. But before we know what it's trying to say, I want to introduce the players of the story to you. So we have the Israelites versus the Assyrians. Now the Israelites are famous because that's God's chosen people. They came from Abraham. You know, Abraham had kids. They had kids. All of them had kids. They spread and they bred like wild bunnies. And before the world knew it, there was just full of Israelites. They were God's chosen people. But also what happened with the Israelites is they were also kind of a little bit rebellious. So they were constantly being attacked by other people. Last week we talked about them being attacked uh, by the Philistines. This week we're talking about them being attacked by the Assyrians. The Assyrians was another nation. And they, they hated the Israelites. Not only did they hate the Israelites, but they hated the God that the Israelites followed. And so the character... The, the characteristics that define this relationship between Israelites and Assyrians. Good guys, bad guys. There's three words that define the character of this relationship. And it's, it's these here. It's invade, deport, and lay siege. This sums up their relationship. So let me show you where this plays out in the Bible. Okay, 2 Kings is where we are. And this is, when I, when I, it wasn't me being clever coming up with invade, deport, and lay siege. This is quite literally the Assyrian um, strategy for taking over another native uh, or another group of people for conquering a nation. And so we see 2 Kings 15, 19. It says, then Pul, king of Assyria, invaded the land. Okay, they go in, they invade. Then if we look at 2 Corinthians 15, 29... Yeah, I read this and I thought, I'm so frustrated with this verse. I'm going to take all these words out and just put a dot, dot, dot. And then he took Gilead and, you know, and then go from there. But I thought, that's me being lazy. But in the time of Pekah, king of Israel, Tiglath, see what I mean? See how hard these words are? Anyway, the king of Assyria, he came and he took Ejon, Abel, Beth, Micah, other people. He took them. Okay. There's a Bible scholar somewhere that's like, this guy's leading a church, you know? So the, the, the king of Israel was taken, and the Assyrian king came in. He took Gilead and, and Galilee, which are places, and including all the land of Naphtali, and he deported the people to Assyria. So you have all of Israel kind of being overtaken. They've been invaded, they get deported, they would bring them into Assyria, they would strip them of their culture, strip them of their language, strip them of their ethnicity, and then blend them into what it was to be an Assyrian. Now the last thing that they were famous at doing was laying siege. And again, we find this word for word in the Bible. In King Hezekiah's fourth year, which was the seventh year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, marched against Samaria and laid siege to it. So what laying siege to something was, is they would surround a city, and they would just keep anything from coming in. And eventually the city would starve. And eventually the city would come to a place where they had to surrender. And so, so they would lay siege to these cities. So that's the relationship. It's invade, deport, or lay siege. See, we need to understand this. It's very important to, to this story. Assyria hated Israel. They hated Israel with an unrelenting intensity. They were determined to annihilate Israel and its God. 
This is not just friendly hate. Assyria wanted to annihilate them off the face of the earth. Not only did they want to destroy Israel off the face of the earth, they wanted to destroy every remnant and memory and saying that came from who they called their God. Assyria was aggressive at doing this. And so that's where we enter into the story, Jonah and the well. You have the Israelites who are constantly being invaded, deported, and laid siege to. You have the Assyrians who are having a great time just destroying Israel and, and everything about it. And then all of a sudden we get the guy that we all know, that we all want to be you know, associated with in the story. We get Jonah. So Jonah was a prophet. And what a prophet did in this day and age, the prophet, he was in charge of taking God's directive or taking God's voice and taking it to the people. So it wasn't like we have now. So now I woke up this morning. I had a quiet time. I talked to God. God talked back to me. It was great. It was fantastic. That can happen every single day. You sit in here now can talk to God. God can talk back to you. It's fantastic. In the Old Testament, before Jesus came, they didn't have that. So what happened was God would speak to some people and he would call prophets. And these prophets would then take God's word. And usually it was bad news. And it would take it to the people of Israel and it would say, okay, this is what God has decreed and this is what God has said. Now you need to do it. And that was the role of a prophet. And so Jonah is a prophet. So Jonah is going to receive instruction from God. And so we find that in Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, Jonah gets his directive from God. God says, and the word says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. So Jonah's hearing from God. The son of Amittai saying, Go to Nineveh. Nineveh is a city. The great city and proclaim judgment against it. This sounds like a fun mission already. For their wickedness has come up before me. So what God is telling Jonah to do, you're going to go to this city and tell them that they're so bad that I'm going to come down and judge them and probably wipe them all out. Jonah's like, Okay, that's fantastic. You know, Samuel got to go and anoint a king, and you want me to go tell a, a city that it's going to be wiped off the face of the earth? That's kind of not fair. I'm drawing the short card here as a prophet. You see, it was especially kind of hard, or especially hard to imagine, because Jonah was called to the city of Nineveh. Do you know what the city of Nineveh was? It, it, it's a, okay, so I want every, we're going to read all, no, we're not going to read that. This is, just want you to get a slight visual. This is the city of Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrians. So this is the heartbeat of the Assyrian people, is Nineveh. That's the heartbeat of the people whose sole purpose is to wipe Israel off the face of the planet, is Nineveh. It's the place where God told Jonah, go tell them that I'm going to judge them. It's Nineveh. Nineveh was one of the, it was either the first or second, I can't remember my research now. It was either the first or second largest city in the known world at that time. There were 120,000 people that lived in the city. There were 15 gates placed around the wall, the fortified wall of the city. It took a three-day walk to walk around the gates and around the city. Nineveh is a huge city. Not only is it a huge city, but it's the heartbeat, the soul, the capital of the Assyrian army. And now this great prophet Jonah is given an instruction to go up to this city, which is like um, 800 kilometers away from where Jonah was, to walk 800 kilometers to walk into the city and tell them that God's going to wipe them clean. And so God tells Jonah to do this. So Jonah responds. He, he talks back to God. And he says, this is what happened. But Jonah ran away. He ran away to Tarshish to escape from the presence of the Lord and his duty as a prophet. Did you know that Jonah is the first prophet that did not obey God's directive? He's the first one. All the other prophets before him, God said, do it. And they said, okay, I'll do it. But Jonah's told, hey, I want you to go do this. And Jonah's the first one to disobey. So he, he says, I'm going to escape from the presence of the Lord. And then what he does is he goes down to Joppa, which is like a, a town. It's a, um, it's, it's a sea, it's a town on the ocean, and there's a port there. And he found a ship going to Tarshish. Tarshish is like the other direction of where he needed to go. It's the most remote of the Phoenician trading cities. Jonah's trying to really disappear here. So he paid the fare, and he went down into the ship to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. So he's, he, Jonah was escaping God. 
So uh, just to pause here. When we think about the reality that God has called this prophet, this man, to go to the most dangerous place possible, that he could go, and Jonah instead retreats, and he goes the complete opposite way, that seems like an acceptable, normal response from a person. Maybe even from a prophet. Because they would be afraid to enter the city of Nineveh and immediately get killed or get wiped out themselves. But that's not why Jonah said no. Jonah said no because he was escaping God. That's what it says in the scripture. Jonah was escaping God and his prophet, his duties as a prophet. So let's just imagine this. Let's imagine that Jonah's not afraid of the Assyrians. Let's imagine that Jonah is confident that God's got his back. Let's imagine that Jonah knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that he will be in no danger because of the God that he has behind him. Now you take that version of Jonah, and he escapes, fleeing from God. You think, okay, why? Why would he do that? What's going on in his mind that would cause him to want to escape a duty from God? Because we think, why would you, why on earth would you escape that? You could go in there and be the man. You could go in there and just rain down fire on these people, and God's got your back, and you don't have to worry about anything, and you're just the man. But Jonah escapes. In fact, let me show you how far he tries to go away. Jonah starts here at point A. Jonah's trying to get here at point C. That's a long way away. Jonah's committed to escaping God. If he can just get on this boat and and get on his way to Tarshish, then it's like he's committed. He's very committed to escaping. It's like... It's not just a kind of a breakup. I mean, this is like a breakup, delete your number, throw your phone away, eject the SIM card. This is over. It's done. You're never going to find me again. That's what Jonah is doing here. But it, it doesn't work out for him. See, Jonah goes down into the ship. And with every step Jonah takes down into the ship, he's taking a step away from God. He's taking a step away from obedience. He's taking a step toward his own agenda or towards his own justification. And so God has a little bit of fun with Jonah. And and right here, not far from when he set sail, we look at verse uh, 4 here and it says this, But the Lord hurled. It's not that it just was a storm. The Lord hurled. Think about your cricket pitcher. The Lord hurled a great wind towards the sea. And there was a violent tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to break up. This thing was about to Titanic itself, break in half and sink to two different areas in the bottom of the ocean. And so the sailors are afraid. And each man cried out to his God. This is a pretty normal thing. It's like, I'll try my God. I'll pray to my God. Okay, the sea is still raging. Now you pray to your God. Okay, the sea is still raging. Okay, who's not prayed to their God because this thing is still raging. We're still going to die here. And, and, and they're looking. Okay, I've prayed. I've prayed. I've prayed. Wait, isn't there one more guy? Shouldn't there be one more guy on here? And so what they do is after they've cried out to their God, in order to lighten the ship and diminish the damage, they throw the ship's cargo into the sea. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship and had lain down and was sound asleep. You know what's crazy here? Is while everybody is, is having um, a, a horrific time of their life, trying to see if they're even going to survive a storm, Jonah is asleep in the bottom of a boat. What kind of man sleeps through a storm on a boat? Guess who else slept through a storm on a boat? Jesus. Guess what they both shared, Jonah and Jesus? They shared a characteristic that they trusted their heavenly Father, and therefore they were not afraid. Jonah is not fleeing from Assyria because he's afraid for his life. Jonah's fleeing from Assyria because he knows how powerful God is, and he doesn't want to give God to Assyria. So he says, I'm out of here. Jonah's asleep on the boat. Because he knows that God's got his back. And so the captain comes down in verse 6. The captain comes up to him and says, How can you stay asleep? Get up. Call on your God. Perhaps your God will give a thought to us so that we will not perish. John is thinking, well, here we go. Because I know that my God's going to answer. And then in verse 7, it goes on to say, 
And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots. Casting lots was them saying, we can't figure this out. So what we're going to do is we're going to cast lots. We're going to draw straws, basically. And, and we're going to give it over to the gods. The gods are going to tell us who's done what and when and where. And they're going to they're sort it out for us. So they cast lots. And guess what? God uses that. And he learns that, they can, that to blame for the disaster, they cast lots and it's Jonah. It all lays on Jonah. Now the men here, before we go on in this verse, the men have a moral dilemma here because they actually don't want to throw Jonah over the ship. They actually try harder to row through the waves. These guys were, were maybe not Christians. They weren't Christ followers. So they're praying to pagan gods, but they're not animals. They're reluctant to throw Jonah over the side. But eventually Jonah says, yeah, you know, I am the problem. you got to get rid of me. And so in verse 15, they picked up Jonah and they threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. Then the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord. That's Jonah's God. And they made vows to the Lord, which is Jonah's God. And then in verse 17, it says, Now the Lord had prepared, so now the main character comes in, The Lord had prepared and appointed or destined a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of this fish three days and three nights. We've got a, 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 a graphic here to kind of illustrate this. You know, Jonah, he's in this fish. So Jonah, Mr. Tough Guy, Mr. I trust in God, Mr. I can sleep through a storm. When he's thrown over the side of the boat, the men are able to row on. And the, the storm starts to calm. But Jonah, if you read further in the chapter, Jonah is praying. He's talking about how the seaweed takes over his head. And the seaweed wraps around him. And he starts to sink to the bottom. And he can't get his head above the water. And he knows he's dead. He knows he's going to die. He's going to drown. He says, oh man, this is the end of my life. Then this fish comes along and swallows him. And Jonah, from inside the belly of the well, prays this prayer to God. And he says, you saved me. I'm sorry. I'll follow you. I repent. I'll follow you. He prays this beautiful prayer. This prayer of God, you came and rescued me from the depths of the sea. And because of that, because of your grace and your compassion for me, I will do what you ask me to do. And so, if we pull our map back up here again, Jonah, he only made it like this far, like that far. God didn't let him get too far down, down the ocean. And the fish swims right back to where he started and throws him up on the beach. And then Jonah has to walk the 800 kilometers over to Nineveh. Now, if we want to talk about, I'm not here to debate the fish, you know, maybe it was a, it was a whale, maybe God just created an animal uh, for this purpose, you know, I, I don't know. But, but that's not why this story was written down. It wasn't written down because of the whale. It was written down so that Israel could remember it for a much greater and much, actually for them, stranger reason. So Jonah goes on to Nineveh. And he walks into Nineveh and he starts doing this thing. You guys need to repent, repent, or God is going to, going to rain down fire on you. God's going to destroy you all. And guess what happens? Every single person repents. Everybody. Even the king. And then the king decrees that everyone should strip their clothes, put on sackcloth, rub ash all over their body, even their animals. The king says, we're going to repent. We're going to make our animals repent. Everyone's repenting. And if you don't, you're dead. Because we're all going to repent and we're going to let the God of Jonah rule in this city. So Jonah goes and everything Jonah knew that God would do, he does. Get, I love Jonah's response to this. I love it. Jonah sees this amazing stuff happen. He sees God move in an amazing way to have the king decree in the capital city of the Assyrians that everyone must repent and follow God. To have that happen, Jonah, he's just bursting with joy in his heart and with all the joy. He says this in, in chapter 4, verse 1. He says, but it greatly displeased Jonah and he became angry. Why? Why was Jonah mad? Jonah, this is beyond petty. He's seen a miracle. He was swallowed by a fish. 
He made it 800K to Nineveh. Nineveh turned its life around. God spared the city. And Jonah is displeased and he becomes angry. Then in verse 2, it goes on to say that he actually prays to the Lord. This is his second prayer to God now. He prays to the Lord and he said, Oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still in my country? That is why I ran to Tarshish. Jonah's saying, I knew this would happen. I knew you would save all of Nineveh. How crazy is that? Jonah's saying, I knew you would save them. So I ran away. I said this would happen. It's happening. And I'm mad about it. Now I'm angry. You saved 120,000 people and I'm upset. That's why this was written down because that's the part that doesn't make sense. We get stuck on a whale. But the thing that actually doesn't make sense is that God moves and 120,000 people in a capital city, their lives are saved and turn around and they start worshiping God. And Jonah's upset because he knew it would happen and he went and he did it and he's angry. And he goes on to say, he goes on to say, because I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God. You are slow to anger. You're great in loving kindness. And when sinners turn to you, you revoke the sentence of disaster against them. Jonah knew it. He, he knew the character of God. And because he knew the character of God, he knew what would happen to the Assyrians if he took God to their city. And now in the next verse, in, in verse 2 here, it says this, as they put it up for you. Therefore now, O Lord, this is Jonah talking, just take my life for me, for it is better for me to die than it is to live. Jonah's literally asking God to die. You remember when Jonah was drowning in the ocean and he was literally asking God to save his life? Now he's literally asking God to die. And in fact, when you look at the text and you look at the Greek and the use of the words, life, it's the same, it's the same. there's no metaphor here. Jonah really just wants to die. So... Why was Jonah so angry? The answer to this question is why this is written down. See, this is brilliant. Because Jonah just listed off the characteristics of God. The, the confession of the compassion. The confession of the compassionate character of God. The confession of the compassionate character of God. Jonah talking about how compassionate God's character is. The confession of that is what fueled Jonah's anger. See, the Ninevites, they are extended the same mercy that God extended to Jonah when he was drowning. The mercy is the same. Jonah was given mercy when he was drowning, and the Ninevites are given mercy because they're all about to drown. They're just going to drown above land. But God saves disobedient Jonah through mercy, and he saves disobedient Nineveh through mercy. So Nineveh being saved, Jonah being saved, with the same mercy equals Jonah saying, I want to die. That's a messed up equation. That's messed up. That's why this is written down. Because th this, is what's, this is the wildest part of the story. See, in, in their defense, see, there, and for, for us in our defense, there are supposed to be definite categories of good and evil. That's, what, that's how movies are made. There's good guys, there's bad guys. Yesterday I took a walk with my son Benjamin, and, and he's carrying around a stick, and he says, we're good guys today, and we're going to get all the bad guys. It was cute, it was adorable, it also made the walk go incredibly slow. Because there are bad guys everywhere. And I had to explain, bad guys can't be in the middle of the road because if cars are coming, you're going to get... So it was a mess. But we, we grew up with these categories. Good, bad, good, bad. And they're easy. It's like, my political agenda is good. Your political agenda is bad. My take on this is good. Your take on this is bad. Um, my favorite team, you know, obviously uh, South Africa rugby is good and New Zealand rugby is bad. You know, obviously Liverpool is good and then Chelsea is bad. You know, so there's, there's different, you know, there's, there's clear good versus bad. But what this story does is this story breaks all the rules. This story breaks all the rules down. Because you have a prophet that's, that's, that's trying to run away from God. 
That shouldn't happen. You have sailors on a boat that don't believe in God that are praying and then praising God. You have the prophet that, that has to be asked by the sinner to pray to his God. You have a city that shouldn't receive grace that gets grace. You have, you have all these things that break the bias, that break our, our, our narrative, our natural inclination of what good is and what bad is. And in this story, all the rules are broken. So who is good? Who is bad? What is good? What is bad? That, that's why this is written down. That's, that's what Israel wanted us to remember, that, that there's good and there's bad. But we're not in charge of what's good and what's bad. We're just in charge of being obedient. And so then the Lord says in verse 4, it's kind of a funny thing here. The Lord says to Jonah, do you have a good reason to be angry? I want you to remember that question. Do you have a good reason to be angry? Because now God's going to teach a lesson on compassion to, to Jonah here. And th this lesson is, is going to um, bring some things out for Jonah. See, we, we think Jonah's about disobedience or obedience. I think it's a lot about compassion and having God's compassion. And so just quickly to get through this. Then Jonah went out of the city and he sat east of it. There he made himself a shelter. He sat under its shade so that he could see what, what was happening in the city. So Jonah's mad at the city. He goes out of the city, makes a shelter so that he can see what's happening inside the city because he wants to be able to look at what he's mad at. You guys ever do that? You get mad at your neighbors and you spend more time looking out the window to see what they're doing so that you can be ready to get mad at them whenever they do the thing that they're going to do that's going to make you mad. That's what Jonah's here doing. I'm just waiting. I'm waiting to see what they do so I can just get more mad at them. Then in verse 6, it goes on to say, So the Lord prepared a plant. Now God's going to play a game with Jonah. God prepares a plant and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to spare him from discomfort. And guess what? Jonah was extremely happy about the protection of the plant. He's like, this, the shade is great. Thank you so much. Then in the next verse, in verse 7, But God prepared a worm when morning dawned the next day and it attacked the plant and it withered. When the sun came up, God prepared a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he fainted and he wished to die. He actually said, it would be better for me to die than to live. Now, remember the question that God asked Jonah. Jonah, do you have anything to be angry about? That comes back in verse 9. In verse 9, God says to Jonah, Jonah, do you have a good reason to be angry? I, you know, if I were Jonah, I'd be like, shut up. He says, do you have a reason to be angry about the loss of the plant? And he said, I have a very good reason to be angry. Yes. And I'm angry enough that I could die. And then in verse 10, then the Lord says to him, you had compassion on a plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. And God says the most important line in this entire story. In verse 11, God says, should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 innocent persons who don't know the difference between their right and their left, and they're not yet accountable for their sin, as well as blameless, you know, the animals aren't blameless. God is saying, you got more mad over a worm. You had more compassion for a plant. Sorry, Jonah, you had more compassion for a plant than you had for a city of 120,000 people. What's wrong with you here? And see, that's why I think that this is written down. See, this story wasn't written down because of a whale. That's not why this was written down. You know why this story was written down? Because God wanted and Israel wanted us to remember that this hard truth. is, And you guys are going to have to swallow a big pill of truth here for this this morning. It's the people that you loathe are loved by God. See... The people that we loathe, we just want them to get what they deserve. That's, our, that's us speaking. But God is saying, the people that you loathe, you loathe the Assyrians, Jonah. You tried to keep me out of their city. I, took, I, I went there anyway, and I took you there. And you may loathe them, but I love them. So if you've been hurt by somebody, or you've had something happen in your life, that person that you loathe, God loves them. And then guess what else you have to understand through this story? Is that God loves everyone as much as God loves you. 
See, it's easy to put yourself in Jonah's shoes and say, well, of course God saved me. I mean, I'm Jonah. That's why God delivered me. But you know what? God loves Assyria as much as God loves Jonah. God loves you as much as God loves the person that you don't think deserves God's love. God loves you as much as God loves your enemy. See, good and bad is out the window. We're all bad, and God is good. That's it. That's the scale. That's the equation. We are bad. God is good. Period. Done. But we have to let go and realize that through this story, that God loves everyone as much as God loves you. So I've got three questions for you as I finish. And these three questions, we're going to pray into them. And, and before I get into these questions here, uh, again, if the power goes out, we'll, we'll just stay calm, turn flashlights on, we'll work our way out um, to tea and coffee. But the three questions for you is, how does this change you and God? How does this change you with others? And how do you see God for others? See, Jonah had a reckoning with God where he had to change the nature of his relationship with God. And God pushed on Jonah and made that relationship change. You with others, Jonah had to understand that God loved Nineveh as much as God loves him. Who is it in your life that you need to accept that God loves them as much as God loves you? And then how you see God for others. Do you see that God is available for the person that's hurt you or the person that seems to be against you? Or do you just hope that they get what they deserve? See, what I'm trying here to do is, is create a mind shift for us. And the ultimate truth is this. You are loved by God. Everyone else is also loved by God. Whether they agree with you or disagree with you. Whether they're good or whether they're bad. And if you accept God's love, then you have a role to play in allowing that other person that you loathe to also accept God's love. And so I want you to think about, is, there that, is that in my life? Who is my Nineveh? And where am I acting like a Jonah? Where I know how good God's love is, but I just want to keep it from somebody else because they don't deserve it. See, that's why this story was written. Not because of a whale, but because of an even harder truth to understand that God's love is for everyone, even those that you don't think deserve it. You know, at one point in time, you may have been somebody that someone else wrote off and said, no, this person doesn't deserve God. But God came and changed your life, and now you're sitting here. Praise the Lord for you being here. But who else is out there that doesn't know? You know, we have a role to play in bringing them in so that they know. So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Um, I'm going to lead us through a prayer, and then the band's going to come out, and, and we're going to try and squeak in another song and a response time. Uh, before the, uh, the power goes out. And, and after, when the band plays, we've got prayer partners that are going to come forward. And even if the power goes out, our prayer partners are going to gather over here by the front exit because when the doors open there, there'll be enough light that pours in. So if you need prayer, then we, we still have prayer you know, available for you up here. So don't, don't shy away from that. But let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, I pray that you reveal to people... You reveal...